Good evening, everybody. Hello. Welcome to this Conversations That Matter. Uh, I'm Suzanne Alderson, and I'm your host for this session. I'm the founder of the charity Parenting Mental Health and also the author of Never Let Go, How to Parent Your Child Through Mental Illness. And I'm absolutely delighted. I realise I'm sharing now because you can't see our lovely faces or Eliza's lovely face. I'm absolutely delighted that tonight's Conversations That Matter um, is with the wonderful Eliza Fricker, who is a mother um, of a PDA child, um, an illustrator and author of the blog Missing the Mark, as well as the Sunday Times bestseller Can't Not Won't, and Eliza's amazing illustrations, really hard hitting and uh, really familiar for so many of us. Um, show like the reality really of parenting and uh, a child um, who can't go to school and also dealing with the kind of froth around that with teachers and schools and local authorities and all the rest of it. Um, so Eliza's here tonight to discuss her experiences, to answer your questions and we've got a chat, uh, sorry, we've got a Q&A box so you can put your questions in there and we'll get through as many of those as we can. So uh, without further ado, welcome, Eliza. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Lovely to see you. I first found you uh, and your work on Twitter and I was really struck because uh, your illustrations are, um, there's a quiet simplicity to them. And I think it's so powerful because the emotions we feel as parents when our child can't go to school um, are just so deep, aren't they? So big. And we don't talk about it, do we? Um, can you share your experience of parenting a child who can't, not won't go to school? Yeah, I think there is an enormous amount of shame around that, isn't there? Um, I think it it starts with, um, I mentioned earlier before we came on here, I think we were very much led to believe that this hadn't been seen before, um, which is a very isolating, that immediately isolates you as a parent. Um, and, and so I think you've got that, and then that kind of isolation and shame, you know, it's not something to share. And I think I probably tried at times, you know, I had friends at the school gates, but it's really, really difficult for other people to understand. And what often will come back at you is very traditional parenting narratives. So all of this again, you know, which I try and show sympathetically and empathetically in my illustrations, the other people, it mainly is coming from a place of wanting to help. People don't know what to say, but often those things that are said back at you um, are very, very unhelpful. Um, and that's not necessarily their fault. They just don't know. You know, another parent who isn't experiencing that um, isn't going to know. And I remember going round to a friend's house for dinner one night and she just put her boys to bed. Um, I think they even had sort of matching um, matching Enid Blyton sort of pyjamas on. <laughs> you know, and they went up to bed with their books and she said, right, you know, night, night. And it, to me, that was completely alien, you know. And that's when I sort of thought, yeah, why, why is she going to understand my, my life and my situation um, as well, meaning as a lot of that advice was. So, yes, it's a very, that's where the loneliness comes from. And that's why it's been so lovely seeing the community that's built up on, on, on you know, my Facebook page, for example, you know, these are parents, commun I don't have the time to communicate, unfortunately, with all of them, but I see them interacting. Um, and that's really nice to know that they have that because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have, you know, that connection. Absolutely. I think community, I mean, that's why I started parenting mental health, because I was the same, you know, mm. the child who couldn't go to school, who was suicidal, depressed, and nobody around me for the best of intentions could understand it and certainly couldn't empathize and certainly couldn't help so i think community is just such a powerful thing when we find ourselves at the edges of you know what we meant to well, what what's meant to happen um yeah. so can you take us back to sort of when this first became apparent to you because your daughter um is autistic with a pda profile and i'm saying that because i see it written a lot before we go into what happened when, can we just talk about the language there? You say with a PDA child, how, how do you approach um, the kind of terminology and the language around neurodivergence? Yeah, so um, 
I mean, I just say that she is usually neurodivergent or autistic. Um, I think she identifies as, as similar. Um, but we do talk about PDA a little bit. Um, you know, the setting she's in, there's other PDA kids, so it does come up more now. Um, it's something I think that young children struggle with. Um, and I know parents are quite reluctant to kind of put another thing on them. Um, and I don't think it's necessary. I mean, we don't even have a formal diagnosis of PDA. Um, but she has extreme anxiety and is extremely demand avoidant um, and has all of the the profile of, of a child who is PDA. Um, and knowing about that has been incredibly um, important for us to be able to do what, what is needed for her. And that is a very different way of um, traditional parenting, if you like. And um, we've had a question in that says, how do you explain PDA to someone who hasn't heard of it? So that's probably a really good place to start. Actually. Yeah, I, that's where I normally start with just saying extreme anxiety. Um, so I'll say, you know, she's autistic, but has extreme anxiety. I do bring up more of it if it's a prof professional. So I will talk about demand avoidance, um, direct praise, do not use direct praise, um, being really flexible, um, using indirect language. Those are all real, really key elements to it. Um, and um, of course, living with complete uncertainty at all times, what you're doing in your own life is part of that. Um, but you know, or we can call that going with the flow, whichever way you want to, <laughs> whichever way you want. Going with the flow, maybe that's a new blog for you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh, yes, I like that, okay. Thank you for that. So let's just go back. So um, when was it apparent to you that your daughter was autistic? And when did school become an issue? Uh, I think nursery, they brought up very early on that she was very shy and she was struggling with transitions. So she was struggling to go in and she was struggling when we'd pick her up, she'd be very distressed. Um, and so nursery, she had one nursery teacher that she adored and who was, you know, really liked her. In fact, named her first daughter after my daughter. That's how, how close the bond was. But she would just glue herself to this nursery teacher. Um, and apart from one very close, again, very attached friendship, she really struggled in that environment. And so they were talking about her being shy. And, um, and I think we had one evening, actually, where they, they brought it up, some sort of parents' evening. And um and I was saying, oh, well, I think, you know, she just takes after her father. You know, we all know we're all neurodivergent now, but we didn't, you know, make those links. Um, and then that trajectory carried on through to primary school, really distressed going, really distressed coming home. And actually that sort of pulling herself out of the sort of group activities became more obvious to the school and she was spending more time I mean it was a lovely little school it's like a really artsy little school in the center of our town um you know we thought it'd be really good for her but even there she struggled even though it was tiny and she would go off into the head teacher's office at lunch times um and then I read something it was a letter I think it was called a letter to my daughter I need to dig that out and still see if it's hovering around it was called a letter to my daughter and it was on the Huffington Post and I was reading this thinking oh that really really chimes with my daughter and it was a letter to my autistic daughter um and that's when I brought it up with her the head teacher and I said oh do you do you think this she could be autistic and she said yes I think she could be and then we saw the doctor and he and I'd already been a few times because she was still having a lot of meltdowns um, and he'd always said well come back if it doesn't settle and so I did go went back and, and then we went for the referral and um, yeah it was a strange thing actually I think it was sort of only an hour and then they said yeah you know she, she is autistic and I remember friends saying they can't decide that in an hour how you meant to know you know and I was like oh um, but yeah, so that was that was you know it was it was pretty clear cut actually, and I don't think we waited an awful. I think she was about seven, I think, when when we got the diagnosis, um, and was already on her second school by then, so we'd moved her. Yeah. And did did it get progressively worse as she got older? The school situation. 
It did. So I think that sort of initially she was always considered very bright, um, you know, meeting beyond expected targets. Um, and then I would say it was that kind of key stage two. And I see that a lot in consults with families, very similar trajectory. So that key stage two, when the academic work is ramped up, there's less of the kind of play and usually they lose their teaching assistant. And for often those children who need that co-regulation, losing that TA is a big deal. Um, and that's when she started to leave the classroom because she was looking for that key person to, to find. Yeah. So, yeah. I know. Well, isn't it? I think that's the thing. And uh, for, I mean, I, I experienced this um, for about eight months with Izzy, my daughter, when she was uh, being bullied and, I think the the challenge for us parents and seeing so many parents in parenting mental health go through this is that we can, because of the pressure on us, in some ways lose our empathy for our child. And you and I both there were like, oh, because we've got this vision there of a little girl like seeking that really natural attachment to somebody, that nurture, that compassion, that care, that co-regulation. So how how do you suggest to parents that they deal with this challenge because it can feel you're to blame it's your fault just get them into school that was my little air quotes thing there and you know we talked earlier about the impact on our mental health when our child cannot get into school um how did it impact you and what do you share with parents now i think knowing that there are options i think it starts with reading and reading and reading and listening and listening and listening and getting really really knowledgeable there's so much out there that wasn't there we literally had local authority coffee mornings which told us zero there's so much information out there now there's so much first-hand experience of what it is like to be neurodivergent so i would say get that knowledge first and foremost and then allow that to help you to formulate ideas about, you know, sit in that space, think about what that must be like, and then look at options. And I always say, and I, I actually said, this is a thing we say in our house when, you know, things are stressful or we're trying to work things out. There's always options. And I think that when we're in this, we think it's school or what? You know, in fact, we don't even, I mean, I certainly didn't think what else is there. So I was looking at variations of school so I was looking at you know these little autistic private schools that were just looking like school but smaller um, there's actually a lot of different stuff out there um, and you, even when parents say that they're not they're not in school the the different experiences and the different paths that people have gone within that is vast and I think that that's actually really helpful to know that it's not just school um, not all, I mean, you know, I love a glib analogy, not everyone gets married, you know, it's not for everyone, not everyone can work in an office with 100 people, some of us are self-employed, we need to start looking at it like that, why is it going to work for everyone, it's a standardised system. Completely. I, uh, when we spoke earlier, I was explaining that um, Izzy had got two GCSEs, but had just graduated last year doing a concept art degree something that she'd never have done had she stayed at the school she was at and she basically spent two years either lying in bed gaming or coaching a gaming team a, uh, an esports team or making things and learning self-study self-directed study and I look at it and I think to the outside world we were failing as parents mm. failing her because she wasn't in a typical educational kind of environment and yet what she gained from those years she's now looking and saying I actually lost a lot of learning like formalized learning that I'm now wanting to go back and get it's so interesting isn't it because we're so conditioned that you go to school and you get GCSEs and you go and do a good degree and then you get a job and you get married and you have children blah, 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 and actually we need to take a moment and pause and say there are other ways and I think the the beauty and in the, the individuality in not only neurodivergent children all all children is actually there is no one size fits all. And so we have to kind of be, have that flexibility around it. Yeah. Um, 
I have got a great question here from uh, Lucy, and I just wonder if you might be able to help with this one, Eliza. She says, our son has an ASC diagnosis with anxiety and attachment issues, private diagnosis, just been NHS verified, hurrah, but pinning down any info on attachment issues in relation with neurodivergence seems really controversial slash unclear. Any pointers or recommendations for finding out more about what this means in practical slash life slash tangible terms? Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I think that gets banded around quite a lot. I, I'm sure, you know, I haven't I've never read all our paperwork. I, I, I'd be pretty damn sure that it's in, in our paperwork. When my child was wrapped around my leg, aged eight, howling, they would probably say attachment issues. Um, I... I would just not focus on all of those things and keep your child at the forefront and just keep meeting them where they're at. Um, I think it's really, really important with neurodivergent people that we we scrub out this kind of developmental or stages or where we think they should be at. Um, I was talking to two of my oldest friends stayed a couple of weekends ago, so they are... I've known them since I was 13, 14. And I said, oh, I'm just starting at the age of 44. I'm, I'm ready to go traveling now. So they did the kind of classic. They had a year out, went traveling together, went to university. I couldn't do any of that at that time. Um, but at 44, I'm kind of like ready to do a bit more of that. You get there when you get there. Um, and the same with that kind of attachment stuff. I think it's okay to need your family it's okay to need that co-regulation and you're probably going to need it a lot more if you're going into an environment that doesn't have that for you for six hours a day you're going to need those people my daughter certainly needed me a lot more when she was very distressed by that environment um, and would follow me around the house and need to know that I was constantly there you know I just I, I just think you know be wary of what that label can maybe put in your head and just really focus on what your child is presenting to you um, and meet them where they're at. Great advice. We talked about diagnoses earlier, didn't we, and labels. Mm. What's, your, what's your perspective on them? So that's a big one. I mean, I did that whole podcast about it, which was exploring that, actually. Um I mean, you know, I'm a late diagnosed autistic woman myself. I got my diagnosis last June. It was absolutely amazing to get that diagnosis as someone who has thought le less, of, I thought I was less than, I thought there was, I was other, you know, there was a lot going on there. To get that has given me a confidence and an understanding of myself that has changed my life really, really positively. The difference for our children is that it can, re in a positive way, it can it can mean that we allow ourselves to parent our children different, and that's fantastic. The difference for our children, though, is that they're not making that choice over that diagnosis. We're doing that for them. We're, often we're doing that in the hope that it will open up the doors to support. Um, and sometimes that doesn't happen those doors don't flood open with support. And sometimes our children can even say, as teenagers, as I know, okay, that's great I'm autistic, but why can't I go to school? Why can't, you're saying it's great, I'm stuck here. I've had some tough conversations around that. You know, it's very empowering as an adult, but we have to sort of be careful with our children and make sure that we're doing it in a way that feels safe and we're open with them and, and, and we're able to kind of talk in a genuinely positive way you know I don't want to sort of do a kind of patronizing you know look at look at I think my daughter got offered all these books about famous autistic people so you know I'm telling her she's got to be this amazing person for being autistic you know we got to have really good honest wholesome conversations about it um but it's not I think it's I think as parents you know, we can do all this with or without a diagnosis. We don't need to wait four years for a diagnosis or spend thousands of pounds. We can meet our children where they're at without any of that and, and do it differently. Um, 
I think we talk about it quite a lot, uh, Naomi Fisher and I, we, we've actually started saying pressure sensitive quite a lot in our webinars, just so that it doesn't, parents don't rule out doing these changes and adaptations because they don't have a diagnosis. And I think as well, uh, it does, when, when we're parents, we want to fix stuff and you can't fix. No. Well, you can't fix at all neurodivergence, neither should you try. I think it's really interesting that when you get a diagnosis, so often you then don't see the child, you see the diagnosis. Because you're, as particularly if you're in the throes of crisis in terms of mental health, it can be really easy to focus on the things that you can fix or you feel you should be able to as a parent. And actually, I think for me, diagnosis is about, like you say, access to care, opening doorways to understanding. But I think we really need to make sure that we keep our child that, you know, beautiful, the brilliance of them, their, you know, who they are as people at the heart of everything that we do. Yeah, um, I had conversations in school and they would say, well, we've given her headphones and it's like not all, you know, so in that way, it can really narrow the lens in certain environments. If it, you know, what it should do, obviously, as we know, it should open up our you know, and make us rethink everything and and, re, and, and, and just let us do it, rethink our life and our world into the way that we need it to be for us. But in certain environments, it still narrows that lens of how, how our children are perceived. Do you have a view on CAMS? I mean, we see so many parents whose children are, they go through like the CAMS pathway, they get diagnosed um, with ADHD or as autistic, and then come say, oh, sorry, we can't do anything for you now. It's, you know, all of the things that you're seeing are because they're autistic, because they're neurodivergent. Oh, yeah. And isn't there that thing about anxiety that they say that that's part of being autistic? Yeah. <laughs> you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I would always, with any professional, I would always see, I would always start with your outcome. What do you want to achieve from this? You know, I see parents spend so much money as well, seeing different people, paying for different services, allowing different people into their home when they've already got a child who's already kind of under enormous stress. And I always think, OK, well, what do you want that outcome? Because it's really important that we start with talking about what we want from this, because often a professional, particularly from CAMS, will kind of be under the assumption you want your child back in school. So if you've got a child who is too unwell to attend, they will often think that your goal is to get them back in school. So they will very much give you strategies that are about that. You know, you need a better, you need good sleep hygiene, you need a, you know, so really kind of start with, you know, have some bullet points and, and go to them first and foremost and say, um, this is, and also be really positive, I think. So don't go into all these kind of net, you know, start with, this is what we're doing, this is what's really working for us, um, but this is where we're kind of struggling a bit. Um, I always started by saying that we're doing child-led, holistic, trauma-informed, and then you'd see them go, okay, I know where you're at, so we're not going to start this conversation on two different, you know, and then butt heads. Um, but no, I haven't. <laughs> if you want my personal experience with GAMS, uh, rubbish. I mean, it was just rubbish. You know, I don't want to sit my child in front of a Zoom with a stranger asking, why do you not like school? It's utterly pointless and it's actually quite damaging. Um, it really is. We, uh, my husband said at the time, because when Izzy was going through uh, support from CAMS, basically that was their, yard, their metric, their yardstick, was when she gets back to school, she will be better. And he said, effectively, so she was bullied at school, so school was not a safe place for her. So what they're doing is they're taking a child out of effectively a, a traumatic and dangerous environment. They're helping to fix the child, and then they're going to put the child back into that. So there's no understanding, really, of what the impact of that environment is having on the child. So, I mean... We did, um, I did an illustration for a colleague that I work with um, who runs a tuition service, and we used... Um, we, we used, we used the uh, analogy of Gary and we said, right, imagine you went out of Gary and he was dreadful and all your friends said, don't go out of him, look, you know, he's been awful to you. And you leave Gary, you get over him and then your friend goes, 
right now you're better I think you should go back out with Gary I mean you wouldn't <laughs> you wouldn't do it so why are you doing it with a school environment yeah, we're conditioned aren't we and I think that's the thing that I've seen with parents is so much of this is permission to do something different and assurance that it's okay you, you're doing the right thing by your child and that's that's the best thing you can do yeah but it like you said earlier it is very much about conditioning isn't it because we had had eight years of this uh, of meetings of you know it gets into you it you lose your you lose your sense of self but you also lose your instinct as a parent of what is right and i remember that last meeting saying to them we have done it your way for eight years we've got to do it our way now and that was when we could move away for all of us we had to move away from that we needed that headspace to just go you know i do know what my child needs and actually i grew to know it even more because that time that we were at home as difficult as it was it was an amazing time to reconnect and figure ourselves out and go on a new positive path because before it had been absolutely miserable for all of us and it, it does we talked about the impact it has on parents mental health how do you see that how i mean we see it the whole time that parents are on their knees because of this and it's and there's so many simple adjustments that they could make as educational authorities and all the rest of it but it, it's having a real deep impact on parents and therefore on children as well, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, that can't be underestimated, that impact. You know, one of the difficult questions I often get asked is um, families will say to me, but I can't give up work, you know, I can't, how do you do it? How do you, how do you be at home with a kid? Um, I didn't have any choice over that. You know, it's a horrible thing to say, but it was, that day that that finally broke for us was like she'd been hit by a car. I couldn't go to work. She was so sick. It wasn't about a choice anymore. I wish I hadn't waited to that point. I don't know if she'd have let that plug be pulled before because her anxiety was so high that she needed to kind of stick to this thing even though it was killing her. Um, I didn't have a choice. It wasn't a lifestyle choice. This isn't a place of privilege where I'm like, oh, just, you know, throw the towel in and hang out at home. And, you know, I didn't have a choice. Um, but the impact was obviously on my child catastrophic. Um, but it did, you know, it, it was serious for me too. You know, I was having labyrinthitis attacks. I was dizzy in the street. I was, you know, I was not well either because you're trying to hold that together and that's going to go somewhere. Um, and I see that a lot with families, you know, that amount that, you know, parents are amazing at keeping pulling it out the bag, aren't they? You know, even when you're like, there's nothing left, they find another bit to keep pulling out the bag. Um, and often parents that I speak to, um, they just want some reassurance, really. They know that, you know, of course they know it's their child, but they just want to hear from someone else that's not this kind of feckless character in a dressing gown with a fag on, you know, a, a normal person, that it's okay to do it differently. That's all they want to hear. They're on that kind of precipice. They know, and they just want to hear, is this all right? It is. It absolutely is. And I think if there's one thing that we all take away from tonight, it's about that permission, isn't it? We need to give us um, to do something different because the whole, I, I, whoever it gets appropriated to that quote about, you know, you keep doing the same thing and expecting a, yeah. uh, an outcome, whoever, you know, it might be Barack Obama or Einstein who said that depending on where you look on the internet. But um, I think that's very, very true. We have got loads of questions. So I really want to make sure that we answer these now, if that's okay. It's like, yeah, yeah sure. It's a slow fire around this one. So first of all, what would you say to professionals who label the child's struggle to attend as neglect? Oh, that's not very nice, is it? So they're saying that the parents are neglectful for not getting them in. Yeah, that's that's really difficult. Um, I, I would try to kind of lead them to, to material, source material about this. Um, so anything that you can find out there of people talking about this um and again keeping it's so important that even though this stuff is deeply hurtful 
to keep those lines of communication open. You almost have to become like a politician, you know, so, you know, you even, you, you even have to say, okay, thank you so much for feeding back on that. Where, where, where are you, from? where, where is this coming from? Can I show you some, um, sources of other or resources of other people talking about similar experiences you've got to keep that open however painful it is you've got to keep those lines of communication open and you know i get it you you know you want to get pretty grumpy in some of these meetings but just find somewhere else to put it you know we talk about uh, Naomi and I talked about in our last webinar about the anger where do you put that and it's really important you do put that somewhere but don't put it in those meetings with professionals um, and don't write it Naomi said don't write it in a in a draft email because she's accidentally sent those before she's like do it in a word document write it all down you know all the and and go go crazy with that you know talk about wanting to blow that person up because you're not going to do it but it will get it out and then you can go back head on in that meeting calm and able to deal with it as best you can okay thank you for that and also uh to the louise who asked the question parenting mental health there's forty thousand other parents in there who get what you're feeling <laughs> yeah. come, and share with us. come and share with us because everybody will be in the place where they'll say yeah i kind of understand where you're feeling so thank you for that question um rachel says we're so much more clued up now to our child but we just can't seem to get school or cams to recognize what now seems obvious how can we help them onto the same page i think this is probably very similar to what you've just shared there for louise yeah and i think that it's pick your battles we can spend an enormous amount of energy trying to get people to understand us or get us or get the, you know, they're not all going to get it. Um, that's partly why I started drawing. It was cathartic. It was therapeutic. Um, you know, there was a lot of material out there to kind of be a little bit sneaky and snarky with, with some of these situations. And it really, you know, it really helped me to highlight how ridiculous some of this stuff is. So finding somewhere else to put it is really important and just understanding that not everyone's going to get it. You know, family members aren't going to always get it. Um, and actually skirting around it sometimes, you know, that's a difficult thing because often, you know, if your child's neurodivergent, you're neurodivergent, you'll have this kind of tendency to really want to get this across and, you know, your sense of justice, but they're not all going to get it. Um, Jackie asks, what are the other alternatives to school and can parents offer alternatives without being pressured by the law? Yeah, there's lots and lots of different ways to go with this, really. Um, you've got under that kind of umbrella of being at home, you've got EOTAS, which is education other than at school, which um, is funded by your local authority but it's it's complicated and tricky to get and because you have to prove your child is too unwell to attend but i know families who have got that and then they've got a package of learning um you can go for a kind of self-directed or democratic school so though there's more of those popping up i think there's progressive education website has a list of those on there um you can use home ed groups you can have tuition and some of them now are very holistic tuition in your home so just people to have a nice time and do a bit of learning you can just have a babysitter that gives you a bit of break and you do a complete de-schooling thing and just have your child kind of have a break from it all and just poodle around and find their own interests um there's just so many different avenues with it and there are more and more places now opening up that are talking about being holistic or trauma informed um, so really you know have a good look around and have a look at options um, options are good options keep you sane <laughs> it's my <laughs> mantra <laughs> yes and safe as well I think options keep you safe. so yeah we were when we were talking before the session um, we were talking about uh, the fact that actually you know we have to shift this narrative of the, it, unless you go to school you're not going to do like the things in life that everybody says that you are so Vix asks how would you recommend trying to undo the narrative that schools and GCSEs are vital to a young person's future 
My daughter started to struggle in year 10, and no matter what I said, she remained convinced that she had to get a GCSEs or she would have no future. She's super bright and academic. She managed six GCSEs, all sat at home, but the pressure was so much. I now worry that my youngest, about to start year nine, is starting to struggle with the academic pressure, and she's not naturally as academic as her sister. And it's very, very difficult. And that is, you know, I think we talk a lot about younger children and having these options, but it is difficult with older children they are going to think about this a lot more so it's, it is very very difficult in fact um Naomi and I are writing a book at the minute about helping teenagers with this just so that there's something that they can read and access that is and we're speaking I mean I've got a lot of friends who've gone a very different path in life so we're speaking to a lot of those and going to interview those for the book but it's very very difficult um I think it's just one of those things that you just have to kind of keep drip feeding to them um you know it's okay there's different ways to go um and and talk about that openly as much as you can with them if they're open to talking about it um maybe even it coming from someone else you know my child doesn't think that i'm that interesting or brilliant at most subjects so you know sometimes hearing it from someone else you know if someone else is round and we're having that conversation within earshot can work really effectively um, particularly if it's someone she quite likes um, and also peers you know if there's other kids that are around doing things differently so think creatively about how that information can be presented and also to not necessarily focus on academic achievements as the ways that you engage with um, any kind of uh, positive affirmation so the other things about her that are not about academics and yeah and we had a whole period where we used to say anyone coming into our house we used to say don't mention school don't ask, and even when she was going somewhere don't ask about it you know because that's especially with family and that's kind of a default how school you know all of them are demands aren't they and 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 not you know oh she is um you know demand avoidant or whatever you know, it's just generally, if you're anxious about something, yeah. the last thing you want it to be done is to be put on this, in this spotlight mm -hmm. to describe to somebody who doesn't get it, who cares, but doesn't necessarily understand what's mm -hmm. going on. So no, great advice there. Thank you. Okay, next question for you in the slow, um, the, the little slow kind of procession of questions we've got is from Marianne. She says, my daughter is 13 and was diagnosed autistic last year. She's been unable to attend school for over three years and she received no education from school or local authority. While I want to proceed in a way that is right for her, i.e. homeschool, special, special provision, etc., she quite often changes her mind. Any advice here? Yeah, I think that's very, very common. I've d I saw a friend today actually for a coffee and she was saying the same, you know, you often, it's, it's such a long, arduous process and you fight tooth and nail for this stuff and then your child will turn around and go, I don't want to do it. Or they'll go for a turn or they'll want to change. So I think there is always that uncertainty with it. And that's where it's kind of very much about what we can do for ourselves to manage that uncertainty. Um, I live in a house where it's no or I don't know 98% of the time. Um, now that used to be quite challenging for me to manage and I've you know had to work quite a lot on that um, but it's it's very difficult you know often you are dealing with children that you know and and so sometimes that will be more often than not coming from a place of anxiety and again kind of that that's where that sort of drip feed technique can work really well that I mentioned earlier which is where you just use a very small bit of information one sentence and you drop that in and you give it loads and loads of processing time because often what we do when we really care about someone is we use a lot of language we use a lot of dialogue and you know i don't know if any of you have experienced this but with someone who's highly anxious that can often be met with shut up stop talking you know they don't want to hear it it's too there's my brain when i'm anxious can only process so much and then it just shuts down and and it creates a, a, a kind of rage in me when i when someone's still talking and my brain cannot take on any more information so really succinct 
confident, comfortable sentences, one-liners, drop them in around these things, these ideas, these possibilities, and then walk away and come back. You know, sometimes this is coming back two days later with another line. Um, it, it, it's a lot. This is why this low demand parenting is not just sitting back. You know, there's a lot we have to do. Yeah, definitely. And, and the resourcing ourselves to be able to do it. Yeah. Patience to be able to say, I'm just going to put this down here and I'm going to leave it. You know, yeah. it, is, it is a practice to be able to get to that stage. Yeah. So if you want to go onto the Parenting Mental Health website, we've got a whole load of free videos on the Partnering Not Parenting approach, which is around a low demand parenting. Yeah style but it's very much about you as a parent how can you resource yourself how can you change your communication style manage your own assumptions expectations all that sort of stuff so it's really important that actually i think any of these kind of change starts with us because we need to have the energy the capacity and also i think yeah we've said it before the permission to be able to do something a bit differently so yeah and there's no rush with this stuff you know i think we have a tendency we, we we get into a bit of a panic with this stuff. I've done it, you know, I've seen like a, potentially a provision or thought of something that can work and I'm like all over it. It's okay to take a step back. I mean, if it's going through the local authority anyway, they're not gonna be in any rush. So give yourself plenty of time to kind of think about it, process it yourself and work out a kind of creative way in which you can, you can potentially present this to your child. And remember, it, will often get met with a no. Absolutely. Uh, Christy says, my son is 14, starting year 10, has an ASD diagnosis, likely ADHD too. He's been out of school since the middle of year seven. We battled for two years to try and find the right setting, which is now at home with tutors who come to the house. His severe anxiety means he has become very isolated and homeschooling doesn't help. With no peer interaction, despite having lots of it at primary school lots of gaming, etc. Struggle to know how we can help him, tried so many things, often, often a battle, worry about pushing too much or not enough. Any thoughts or advice? Yeah, I think I can hear your worries about this just in the question, actually. And I think have, you know, have a real think, is it is it a concern for him? Does he seem worried about it? Um, he might be fine um, as he is. Um, you know, if it is a concern, there are, you could potentially get someone in, like a youngish person, a babysitter. We had a, I think she was only sort of 17, used to come in and they just used to look at TikTok and, you know, it was just someone to come in the house when she was too unwell to access anything. Um, but he might not be, you know, I know a lot of parents who have really happy, content children who are just not into socialising, it's just not for them or they do it in a different way, gaming or, you know, a couple of adults in their life is enough for them. Um, it's not the be all and end all and I think often that was something that used to come up quite a lot when we'd have meetings with local authority, it was always like, well, you know, you don't want to isolate them, you want them to be sociable. We're not all sociable. I've got lots of autistic friends who don't go out or don't have relationships, but they're really happy having really great conversations online. So it varies for everyone. Um, it's it's another thing that we're kind of told is is a marker for how well they're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also I think gaming is such a social, can be such a social thing as well and as parents we can be fearful of it and worry that it's going to be they're going to be you know groomed or you know something's going to go wrong online but actually you know it can be a real lifeline for so many yeah or you might have friends in you know i used to always have a lot of people come out you know for a cup of tea or whatever and so my child would see me interacting with people and that might be enough for them just to kind of be you know my daughter for a long time used to just come and sit nearby with headphones on and, and on her phone but she was there and she would sometimes interject and sometimes not but that was her way of, sort of saying I'm over here don't talk to me but I might come over if I fancy it. Uh, Louise says how can you do other than school if when you try services oh, oh sorry if when you try services say the, ch the children are at risk being isolated etc and won't support home learning? Yeah, that's very difficult. Um, that is kind of what local authorities think. They do talk about best place being school. So you do have the option of deregistering um, 
which is just kind of pulling back on all the services and then you're seen as a home educator or a de-schooler. Um, if you have an EHCP, you can electively home educate on that um, or you can go down the EOTAS path. Um, I mean, I don't know whether you'll get lots and lots of casework saying, brilliant, have them at home. You know, they will always talk. Even when we had a, we had a really lovely holistic tuition service that used to come in, um, we still had to talk about it as um, we had to talk that it was it was temporary and that we were all aiming towards getting back to school. We weren't, they weren't either, but that's what we had to say. You know, they're never going to go, brilliant, you can have them at home forever and ever. They're not going to say that. So it's, it's again, playing a kind of careful game slash dance with them that, oh, yes, we're working towards it. She's not quite ready yet. I think the other point is, is there's so much threat understanding. So you might get somebody who's really on it and does get it, and you might get somebody who absolutely isn't. So, I mean, I think that um, quietly, uh, yeah, playing a game with them is probably the best thing. But again, it comes back to permission and understanding that actually you need to really do the best for your child. You don't need to meet the guidelines of the local authority. You actually need to put your child at the heart of what is going on and what's best for them. Uh, Suzanne says, will there be a transcript or recording? The recording will be available on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash at parenting mental health. So yes, that will be on that. Um, Louise says, is there one resource that you would recommend above for others to explain all this to social services slash support services? We get told we need exposure and she will get used to it. She struggled. She is now progressively worse. And then she also asks, would you, what would you say would be the best way to approach learning with a PDA child who can't self-motivate, but also obviously doesn't respond to demands? Mm. Yeah, I think that, well, there's two strands to that, isn't there? So, you know, again, showing them different resources. Um, there is lots and lots of different books out there that you could show them about the neurodivergent experience and talk about, you know, it not being the only play. Give them the Square Pegs book. I don't know if anyone's read that book, but the Square Pegs book by... Uh, independent publishing, independent press um, is a great resource and that's got lots of different people talking about different ways to learn but also experiences that you know that they've had being neurodivergent or different in the school system. Um, so you know lead them into things like that and then I think in terms of them not being motivated as a PDA child you know it's difficult without knowing where they're at on this journey but it could be that they're still in burnout and you know that can take time and it's very different for all different children um bringing the novelty factor into the home can be really good so getting deliveries into the home um i know there's i think they're called spectrum space they make up boxes for children of different things they might be into and then they get delivered to the home but you could do that yourself um, again just being creative for kind of piquing that interest and you know it could be a period of time of complete inactivity it was in our house and then very slowly and I still remember this hearing the kitchen cupboard opening for her to go and get a glass and get a water and just sitting there thinking yes um, you know it's green shoots they're very very little for us and they can take a long time to come um, so just give it time they really can and I think every morning you wake up and they're in bed and the dread sets in and you think oh my goodness is this it forever I can tell you and Eliza can tell you it isn't it forever but patience is definitely your friend here yeah definitely mm. your friend um Sue says my daughter has missed years six seven eight and now nine our story sounds similar to yours apart from we do not have a formal diagnosis diagnosis of ASC as my daughter cannot attend the assessment She's been offered many options. Uh, hospital, school didn't work as it's like school, but smaller. Home tutor does not want it. Uh, she says she wants friends, all sorts of alternative provision, but none are right. Do I just continue to wait until she actually can engage? Despite us not putting any demands at all, her anxiety still cripples her. Mm, I think if that anxiety is still there, just keep going low demand until it's not there. Um, 
you know, like we were saying earlier, it's those green shoots that are indicators that, you know, she's getting to, to a place where she's not dysregulated. So it's really keeping things as low, low demand as you can until that anxiety comes down. Um, and you, you know, you'll start to see that happen over time, but it just could mean that she needs longer. You know, it could be, and again, all very well-meaning. It could be there's been still quite a lot of conversations floating around about where she should go or could go. Um, and again, you know, you're doing that from a positive place, but though, even those suggestions for a highly anxious child could be putting pressure on. Um, equally, I know that I've spoken to other families and when we've unpicked it, there's been an enormous amount of anxiety because that child doesn't know how long they're at home. So they'll be thinking, am I gonna to be told I've got to go back next week, um, next term? And that can create its own anxiety. So again, you know, perhaps with that drip feed technique, working out a way that you have something that you can say safely, succinctly around that, why they're at home and how long they're going to be at home. Um, that can create an enormous amount of safety for a really anxious child who doesn't know how long they're at home. Am I going to be asked tomorrow that I've got to try this thing or are they going to come in? You know, often even us going in that room, we don't realise it, but often, you know, again, when I speak to families and we unpick it, they're like, oh yeah, every time I'm going in the room, I'm going in with a demand or an expectation. So that child is like, <gasps> you know, just go in that room, hang out, have a nice time, become this person that isn't, and it's very difficult when you're worried about your child, but that isn't demand laden yourself because often we carry a lot of demands and expectations and our children are hyper vigilant when they're anxious they're sensing it they're seeing it completely great advice thank you for that and i'm sure suze will take that on board because uh, she's been doing an amazing job so far um debbie says my son is almost 18 and has struggled to attend school and now college his attendance is low again and he's due to go back in september for his second year I feel he's very anxious and possibly neurodivergent. The worry I have is once he's 18, I won't be able to help him. He's reluctant to go for help or counselling. How can I navigate this as he's on a contract at college and may get thrown out? Yeah, and again, it's just time, isn't it? I think, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but anxiety it's not just PDA, anyone who is anxious feels those demands a lot more, that everyone will carry their own internal demands without needing those external ones as well. He will not be sitting in his room completely not thinking about this ever. He will be churning this over. So it's about creating that safe space for him to just take time over it. Um, you know, it can, and it can take a long time. I don't want to say, you know, you're going to be in this position for how many years but you know depending on how long he's been in that system will depend on how long perhaps it can take him to 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 recover from that and take that pressure off himself um and so really become that really safe person that takes that pressure off for him and one thing that we all need as human beings is agency so when there is no sense of agency, it can be really hard to make any kind of change, aside from how physiologically that anxiety is presenting in us. So really important there that we give our children choice and voice uh, when this when it's possible for them to um, reply, I suppose. Uh, right, I've got a couple more questions for you. My son hasn't been at school for 18 months and is not engaging with online tuition, which isn't too much of a concern for me. The only thing he can leave the house for is one-to-one -one football coaching. He wants to be able to play in a football team, but he will get to the pitch and warm up with his friends but can't play the match. I'm fine with that, but he wants to be able to do it. Really hard. I mean, you know, my book's called Card Not Won't. You know, it's not that these children or young people don't want to be able to do this stuff. Um, and I think, again, it's it's how we present that, where we take that pressure off for them um, as much as we can, because obviously you're seeing there how much demand he's putting on himself over this stuff. So really holding that time and space for him and saying, don't worry about it, you can try again next week. Take our expectation, our hope of that working for him, which is incredibly hard because we care and we can see their disappointment. Um, but that's kind of... Yeah, just take it, take as much of that off their shoulders as we can. 
And um, I regularly get told, final question for you before we go to your quick fire. This was a slow fire, we're gonna have a quick fire round. So uh, I regularly get told that I lack boundaries with, my ch with the children and my parenting is too relaxed. How do I change that to actually, my child needs low demands and it's not a bad thing? So that's coming from other people saying this stuff? So yeah, I, get, um, I regularly get told I lack boundaries with the children and my parenting is too relaxed. How do I change that to actually my child needs low demands and it's not a bad thing? I think that's how do I share with other people that my relaxed parenting is, you know, I do have boundaries. It's not that I don't, but this is actually what they need. Yeah, I think perhaps find those people that, that get it and the ones that don't just edit what you talk about with them you know just I've got friends that are good friends but they wouldn't get it I just don't talk about it with them you know because I don't want to have that conversation with them I don't want to get into something where they're just not going to get it I don't I've had enough pullbacks weird facial expressions like I don't need that anymore um and but I also need them for different things in my life they're good people they're good fun or we have good you know intellectual conversations so I'm kind of mindful of who who I talk about it with now um and I would say keep to the positives you know if people sort of often we kind of people go oh how's it going and we'll be like well you know up and down and then they'll be like well then that needs fix you know say it's great yeah really working out at the minute thanks just you know cut it <laughs> have a script have a script and use different ones on different people choose who needs needs to hear what um because you need that energy what what low demand parenting takes is a enormous amount of our self and our energy and where we need to keep that and conserve that is for that home space and keeping that well resourced and and topped up and f for me having those kind of conversations come into it really impact me and and will take it sap my energy and i need that energy for our home and also it's not just us as parents that are fixers it's everybody else everyone wants to think that you haven't thought of or couldn't you just try so i think you're absolutely right it's about your own boundaries in many ways isn't it about protecting yeah for that um you've got a thank you from debbie to say thank you for everything you do to help people like us i wish i'd known all of this four years ago but i'm grateful to have learned with you when i found you so that's Aww, thanks so quick fire round now if we're gonna give away a copy of eliza's amazing book can't not won't uh you'll find the details in our facebook group parenting mental health um but can you just briefly tell us what to expect in well, i'm doing it the wrong way there can't not wait <laughs> kind of a very good tv hostess there but um what can we expect in the book so it's the story of eight years in the education system and those experiences through diagnosis um through the meetings through the parenting groups um and then as well as sort of little um bits of what was going on meanwhile at home um at the end of the book there is two contributors. There is Tom Vodden, who is a Senko school governor and also had a child who was unable to attend school. And he breaks down lots of bits of the book, lots of things that were said to me. So we use quotes through the book of different things that were said. And he really unpicks that. And he does that from the point of being a, a teacher and an educator. Um, and he's I mean, he's also on my podcast actually there's a brilliant bit where he talks on that where someone says have you tried a parenting class and he says thanks very much I've got an MA in you know autism teacher like yeah so he's he's very very funny but he, he really unpicks a lot of this stuff that we experience and and and, and offers some really valuable advice in there um, and his daughter actually he sent me a certificate she got a something ridiculous like a triple distinction at college this week so that's a child who wasn't going to school so he thought I'd quite like that um, and there's also Sue Moon who is um, an occupational therapist she talks about the autistic experience and how we can meet the individual where they're at um, and that's a really lovely kind of bit of writing that my editor actually said I want to give this to every school and they have to stick it in their in their Senko's office and yeah it's really lovely so I think while it's very much kind of the parent slash family 
uh, story on, on, on school anxiety. It's a resource that I know that many professionals have read and the point of me writing it was that first and foremost that they felt empathy reading that. Because I think if anyone starts with a place of empathy, then you're on the right path. You might not know what to do. We don't know what to do. And I think that's a really important thing as well. We don't know what to do as parents. Teachers, professionals don't know what to do often. You know, there are things in life that are complex and there isn't a fix. Um, and that's where I try to kind of meet in the middle with a lot of professionals and teachers because I have so many that engage with my work and are like, I want to do better, I want to help. You know, there's very few teachers that get into this to mess children's lives up. That's not their intention. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Three quick takeaways before we wrap up our conversation for a parent listening who, whether they have a neurodivergent child or not, but their child can't attend school. What would you say to them? I had four and I've forgotten all of them now. Um, I would say keep lines of communication open always. Um, be preemptive with that, with professionals and teachers. You know, just send, keep those emails, that line of communicate, keep it to emails, don't do the phone but keep them to one liners. We have this tendency because we want to, we want them to hear us. We send these long emails. Um, they're not going to read it all. They're not going to have time. Keep it punchy, keep it short, keep it sweet, but be preemptive. Keep checking in, talk about it from in, in a term, talk about being unwell. Um, that's a really powerful thing. I found that was much more powerful than talking about anxiety. Um, she's too unwell. Um, and I would meet your child where they're at, you know, just keep remembering that your child is who they are meant to be and they will get where they need to get. But the most important thing is you keep that relationship with your child. And if you feel, I mean, it was a really powerful, the first time I met Fran Morgan that set up Square Pegs, which Ellie Costello is now running. She said to me, I stood at the top of the stairs and I realised I'd done the worst thing, I'd broken the trust of my child. And that is a very difficult thing to get back. Um, so be mindful of that. The most important thing is your child. You do know the right thing to do for your child and take a step back from all the other outer dialogue, conversation and focus on your child. Where can people find your amazing work, Eliza? all over the shop. I mean, there's my blog, Missing the Mark, um, Facebook. Uh, I think that's up to nearly 40,000 on there. Twitter, Instagram, um, and my books are on Jessica Kingsley's website. So Jessica Kingsley, Kingsley Publishing. There's also the webinars that I do with Naomi Fisher. She has the links on her website to those. Um, yeah. Think that's it that's all of it thank you so much for your time today it's so important that we can have these conversations i think around things that uh break open um that sense of isolation that we feel when our child can't go to school so thank you for joining us i hope this is the first actually eliza i hope we can talk to you again because it's been i know yeah, this it's so been really good really enjoyable so our next Conversations That Matter is on the 23rd of September, I think. Uh, check our website, the events page. I'm going to be joined then by the therapist, author and founder of Creative Counsellors, Tanya Sharp. We're going to explore self-care. And I promise you there will not be an avocado or a <laughs> can do that. Um, I think I got given a scented candle for self-care <laughs> parenting group. Yeah, it doesn't really cut it, does it? So Not uh, really, not when you're on your knees, it feels a little... <laughs> not really. Um, but if you or your organisation is interested in sponsoring one of our conversations that matter, you can email us info at parentingmentalhealth.com for more information. And as a charity, we run on the kindness and support of our uh, donors and donations. So if tonight's session has been helpful for you, I'm just going to pop up a slide that has got a QR code on it 
um, where you can make a donation if that has been helpful. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eliza. It's just been brilliant to see you finally and to, um, to listen and hear your experience and your expertise. So thanks so much for joining us. And thanks for having me. Any, any time at all. <laughs> and I um, hope to see you at the next Conversations That Matter. <laughs>